Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Rebecca Rolf, Executive Director of the San Francisco LGBT Center. Rebecca has served the center for four years and previously led San Francisco Women Against Rape for 20 years. The San Francisco LGBT Center connects diverse communities by fostering economic development, health and wellness, youth and families, policy initiatives, and arts and culture. Rebecca has generously agreed to share some of her experiences with us, and I'd like to thank you, Rebecca, for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm pleased and honored to be here. The role of a community center in a community is, is quite diverse, and different communities have different requirements. Describe what you are doing at the, at the center and how that center binds this community together. It's, uh, it's true. I mean, the uh, community center is a sort of an interesting proposition. Um, and one of the particular challenges with the LGBT community is we are a community of tremendous diversity. So, you know, we reflect, um, you know, sort of every race, class, religion, country of origin, gender, um, background, you know, absolutely everything. Experience, education level. Exactly. So the, you know, the, it's a, um, finding commonality and connection within that can be very challenging. Um, and yet is also, I think, critically important. So really our mission is to look at connecting uh, the diverse community with opportunities and resources and each other, and really looking at doing that within a community building context. So everything we do, we really look at how can we leverage resources and connections within the community to, to have folks bring those together and build both um, a stronger reality for each individual, but also a stronger community overall. And the center itself was conceived and built by members from within the community who saw this need. They didn't see their, their needs necessarily being met by other institutions. Could you talk about those needs and, and, and how those needs come together in, in this incredible cross-section of, of individuals? You know, 45 years ago, we were completely an outsider culture. I mean, you know, we were a very, very marginalized, very hidden kind of community. And so I think, you know, we're not so far from that time um, in, in actual time, certainly we have progressed extremely far in terms of the ability for people to be out, the ability for people to sort of, you know, be accepted in the world. But I, I do think that there's a, a particularly strong need for connection uh, and a particularly strong desire for some, you know, for a community center and for people to come together around sort of a, a common sense, you know, sort of a, a common connection around sexual orientation and, and gender identity. Is this particularly important in a place like San Francisco, which seems to uh, be a, a place that people come to um, after having, in part, been rejected by their communities or having a difficult time in, in living uh, their lives um, within the context of, of a more traditionalist environment? Mm -hmm. I think, it, it, you know, it's interesting. I, I was not involved in the center when they were originally planning and sort of dreaming of, of what the center might ultimately be. But I think that, you know, even at that time, I know there was a lot of controversy around in a place like San Francisco, do we need, do a, we need an center? LGBT community center? And I think, you know, clearly San Francisco is without argument one of the best and most comfortable places to be an LGBT person in the world. I mean, there's just, you know, clearly a huge community here. There's I think uh, the community is very embraced, you know, it, you know, by San Francisco, and, and I think valued. We are achieving civil rights gains. We are achieving acceptance, um, but there continues to still be significant pockets where there where there's not acceptance. So, for instance, uh, a lot of kids growing up in uh, LGBT families, so you know, two moms or two dads or a transgender parent, uh, are really finding that even in schools in the Bay Area that they're experiencing discrimination and that. You know, there, there are sort of um, issues being raised in the schools that make them feel uncomfortable and make them feel, um, you know, not fully a part of, of the community at the school. And so, uh, you know, we, we continue to see things here um, like higher than average rates of unemployment, lower rates of things like home ownership and ability to sort of build assets and really put down roots in the city. So, you know, even though things are better here than almost any place else, there continues to still be ways in which there is sort of discrimination and, and difference. Is the community center also conceived as a place where one can explore the idea of a personhood, personhood that includes one's identity as, as a member of the LGBT community, but also in, includes just an identity of personhood quite apart from that identity and, and the ability to talk 
very candidly, does the uh, San Francisco LGBT Center uh, play a similar role uh, for individuals? You know, I think oftentimes we're forced to sort of choose what part of ourselves we, we're, we're being in any we're given context. Or that, or, right. and, and sometimes even people within the community say, well, if you're not this, you're not, you're, you're, you're not enough of, of who we are and right. all those debates. Right, and all those challenges within communities and, you know, sort of who's, who's you know, queer How enough. Orthodox and, is orthodox and, enough. Exactly. Now, yes. Yeah. So, you know, I think one of our, you know, one of the clear goals that we have is to really... Um, both hold the commonality of our experience and also respect the individual's unique experiences and to really create an environment where people don't have to choose whether they're sort of queer today or, you know, LGBT today, female, you know, maybe a person of color, you know, maybe a person who, you know, that you, you can kind of really come and bring your full, who you really are and not have to sort of segment out your different experiences and your different perspectives. How is this reflected in your programming? You know, a variety of, of ways. You know, one is we, uh, we clearly look at, on the direct services side, how can we ensure that everybody in our community is able to access sort of all the resources that they need to live a sort of a life of sort of a minimum level of safety and security and sort of minimal level of, of being resourced. So, so we, we have the world's first LGBT economic development program. Um, so we look at helping people find jobs, um, get housing, look at building assets. We have the, you know, we reflect the full diversity of the community around us, except we face some specific challenges around um, sort of discrimination in the schools and employment and housing and, and some resources. Uh, challenges about for folks who grew up in families that were not accepting, sort of that, that representing some significant challenges. Um, and I think one of the things that's that's really critical is that there is this myth of gay affluence, you know, and this this sense that you know, the LGBT community is a bunch of uh, two wage earner families, you know, two wage earner adults sitting around without kids trying to figure out, you know, should we spend our discretionary dollars on cocktails or show tunes? And I, I you know, I, I think there's this sort of myth out there. And I think that the reality is that, you know, we do reflect the world around us, but that there are some sort of specific ways that the community is marginalized. And there's very, one of the, the other challenges is there's very little data. So we're not counted in the census. Um, you know, there's, there's, a, a lack of hard data about even how many LGBT, LGBT people there are, where we live, what our economic status is. But from what we can tell, gay men earn about 4% less than their heterosexual counterparts. For lesbians, it appears that it depends on the part of the country that you live in. Um, and so lesbians here in the Bay Area tend to not have a, a wage, you know, wage uh, gap between our heterosexual counterparts, but for two same-sex headed, uh, household, two female headed households, we have double the gender discrimination. So there, there continues to be sort of significant um, sort of gaps and, and, and areas of discrimination. And then there's very specific parts of the community that really get targeted for discrimination. That includes uh, LGBT youth, uh, seniors, uh, folks living with HIV and AIDS, the transgender community. And then folks really dealing with sort of multiple and intersecting issues. So, you know, folks who are dealing with sort of the compound factors of sort of sexism, racism, sexual orientation, and or gender identity, you know, those begin to sort of have a compounding effect. In terms of, of your, uh, your programming to address things like uh, wage disparities, um, how, do you, how do you approach those type of programs? Well, I think as one example, we have a general workforce development program, so we work generally with folks in the community who are looking for jobs and, and with a focus on uh, jobs that have a sustainable wage and benefits. So, you know, sort of create a, a, you know, again, that sort of minimum platform of sustainability. One of the things we did is within, you know, within the overall LGBT community, for instance, there's very, very high rates of un- and underemployment in the transgender community. Mm -hmm. yes. So even in San Francisco, we've got employment protection, uh, and we still continue to see, you know, 75% on and underemployment in the transgender community. So we started a program to really look at how do we help transgender folks get jobs and keep jobs, and and to really look at how do we build that program so that it meets the specific needs of the transgender community. One of the things we found is that sort of two things we found. One is that of course the community is tremendously diverse. So we've got everything from folks who have a PhD in chemistry to folks who've never had a job before. And so, you know, as you can imagine, you know, trying to sort of serve that spectrum of, of folks in the community is, is challenging. 
But another interesting thing we found is that folks could get jobs, but the challenges involved in coming into the workplace as a transgender person and the lack of support in the workplace culture meant that folks were having a hard time keeping jobs. And so one of the things we did in the program is not just help people get jobs, but we developed um, a, an ability to work with the employers to make sure that they were prepared to look at policies and trainings for the rest of the staff so that they could, to the greatest extent possible, support their transgender employees in being successful in their jobs. And also a mentorship program so that we provide peer mentors so that as people are going through the, you know, the job search and then the, the sort of first six to 12 months of employment, they can work with a peer who can really help them, who's been through the process before, who can really help them work through you know, we find that there's a, a number of relatively predictable issues. You know, do, do you come out to your coworkers? Do you have a choice? You know, do you get outed? How do you handle that? How do you handle people asking you questions that you may or may not want to answer? We find that you know many new employees in a workplace have a hard time when uh, they want to go to use a bathroom and get challenged around you know why are you using this bathroom and and so that that we can really provide support around some of those challenges and really help people get through that first six to 12 months of employment, which means that they're just gonna be that much more likely to, to be successful in that job. And in terms of youth, um, youth face some pretty stunning challenges uh, sometimes, ranging from bullying uh, to ostracism to uh, being thrown out of the, their, their living circumstance. Mm -hmm. um, how do you respond to those kinds of needs? Well, we have two different programs where we work with youth. We have one program where we work primarily with school-age youth, um, so that's primarily through the San Francisco high schools. Those uh, kids are primarily living in intact families. Um, and it's we work with both uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, we call them queer and questioning, and allied youth. So it's pretty broad. Um, and that, uh, so we do a lot of work in the schools. We teach the first LGBT studies class in San Francisco Unified School District. It's offered for school credit, it's pretty exciting. Um, but we also do a lot of work in the high schools just working on cultural change, really looking at trying to build networks of, of folks who are willing to work within the school context um, to really address sort of a culture of acceptance and a culture of, of sort of embracing diversity within the school. Um, we have a second program where we work with what we call transitional age youth, and they are primarily youth 16 to 24 who have come here to San Francisco. Most of them have not grown up here, but have come here you know, as you know, emancipated adults or runaways or, or as adults, and really come to San Francisco because they see San Francisco as a mecca for the LGBT community. And the challenge is that they are oftentimes coming out of you know, non-intact families. They're oftentimes coming out of foster care systems or criminal justice system. They have frequently not sort of had um, you know, childhoods that have been sort of thriving opportunities to, to sort of lead to a healthy sort of independent adulthood. So they come sort of with a set of challenges and then find that San Francisco is a very challenging place to live. It's, it's expensive to live here, it's hard to find housing, it's hard to get a job even if you have a great education. Um, the and so are not paved with gold. They are not. And in fact, a lot of kids end up on the street or a cycle of sort of marginal, you know, marginal shelter, you know, living in shelters and couch surfing and that kind of thing. And that just leads to, you know, sort of a cycle of, you know, of challenging, uh, you know, challenging environment. And we find that, um, you know, it's, it's a hard place to be a young person, particularly a young person with needs. So we have a, um, a program where we uh, have a meal night, we offer sort of different kinds of programming where people can come in, get connected to other folks in the community. We get them connected to housing, to employment resources, mental health services, substance abuse services, HIV testing, um, sort of getting on you know various public benefits, looking at trying to get folks into school, and really looking at trying to build relationships with them, both between adults and you know care providers and the youth, and also just building relationships and networks within the, the youth community so that they can support each other. Describe the center as a physical facility and, and your staff. The center is 35,000 square feet. We're at the corner of Market and Octavia. We have uh, long-term tenants who are not mostly nonprofit organizations serving the LGBT community. We have a cyber center. Um, we, have, we host about between two and 300 events a month uh, that include everything from 
12-step programs to press conferences, fundraisers, um, meetings, you know, sort of the full gamut of film festivals, I mean, pretty much the full Educational gamut. events and so on. Absolutely. We have about 25 staff and about 800 volunteers on our roster. Um, and it's really a great group of folks. I mean, just really, um, people really come in, their, come in and roll up their sleeves. Uh, it's a very diverse uh, group in every respect, including, you know, really coming to the desire to work in community, you know, to, to be a part of community, um, you know, from a really wide range of different um, sort of perspectives and motivations and you know, needs um, that they, you know, want to get out of being involved in the center. So it's, it's tremendous. It really is. And, and how does funding work? What, what is your split between earned and, and contributed revenue? Revenue we drive from the building is about 15% of our budget. Uh, we get about 30 to 35 percent of our budget from government contracts, which is technically earned revenue. And the rest is contributed through a pretty broad mix of foundations, corporations, and individuals. So we've got a pretty balanced funding sort of, uh, you know, funding, set of funding sources. And things are reasonably stable. They are. You know, it's, uh, the center's been financially challenged. Uh, you know, we're a young organization. We, uh, the business model that was originally developed when, the, when they were building the building turned out to be uh, sort of not sustainable, and so we've kind of had to go to plan, you know, plan B. But we really, we've, we've stabilized, uh, you know, the economic downturn has been hard for us, hard for everyone. Uh, we have had to really look at what are the hardest core priorities. The, the staff and volunteers have really rolled up their sleeves and figured out how to make it work. Um, the board, we have a tremendous board of directors, 21 incredibly committed individuals who work hours and hours and hours to make sort of, uh, the, you know, it, all, to hold all the pieces together. Um, so it's, I have to say, it's really an inspiring group of people. And it, you know, I think, you know, times are hard for everyone. I think what makes a difficult situation possible is when you feel like you're on a great team and everybody's working together to, to, to move the organization forward. And, and I think that's what sort of can make a difficult situation manageable, or if you don't have that, it can make a difficult situation really, you know, become, you know, a crisis. So what's next for the center? Well, we turned 10 this year, uh, 2012, we turned 10 years old, and uh, it's been a challenging 10 years, so we're gonna take a full 12 months to celebrate. <laughs> uh, and during that time, we're really gonna, you know, look at opportunities to welcome back everybody who's been a part of, everybody from the folks who originally envisioned the center, folks who helped raise the money to get it built, um, you know, folks who have volunteered and come for programs and attended events, you know, our former board, all of our donors, and really look at this as an opportunity to really celebrate that we have really built something, you know, that is, is really of great value and significance to the community. And, and we really built it together. You know, nobody gave this to us. Nobody waved a magic wand. And it, it really does represent um, a lot of dedication and a lot of hard work on the part of literally hundreds and thousands of people. Well, we look uh, forward to your celebration of your, uh, of your 10 years. And uh, thank you so much, Rebecca, for joining us today. It's totally a pleasure, I, 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 again, and, and quite an honor. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you for your insights.